If we really want to talk about what's broken with our juvenile justice system, we have to be willing to engage in difficult conversations about race and about racism. As Phil Williams dug into the problem, he found fixing the problems will require an honest look at why some of our communities are in crisis. Step through the high security doors of Nashville's Juvenile Detention Center and Tennessee's broken juvenile justice system quickly becomes an issue of black and white. When I think about the makeup of the children in our detention facility, the majority are African American and we only hold those youth in our detention facility who we at some point think are a risk to the safety of the community prior to their trial date. Watch out. Oh, no, 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 no. Out on the streets, police see a similar pattern. When those kids make the news, people often see a young criminal. What they may fail to see is the child, a girl whose incredible shyness seems completely incompatible with the rape return murder for which she now faces charges. Another girl also accused of murder who eagerly volunteers, I can make a heart with my hands. A boy accused of shooting a man during an attempted carjacking asked how his life might have been different, responding simply, having a father figure who loved me. And I remember recently going to a, a Martin Luther King Day um, presentation back in, um, in detention with the youth where they were giving speeches um, about civil rights. And, I have a dream. And things that they had learned in One class um, about Martin Luther King this and just thinking them. how far we still have to go. Now is the time that you're going to see us have to, have to call it out for what it is if we want to see change. This is absolutely a public health crisis. Ashford Hughes worked as an advisor to former mayors Megan Berry and David Briley. He says Nashville will continue to lose children of color if the community does not take an honest look at the path that leads to juvenile detention. And you can't just say this community is bad, they just need to be better parents. This community is bad, they aren't doing enough. We have to move beyond blaming the victim and look at the systems. To understand Nashville's juvenile crime problem, advocates say you first have to understand the hand that's been dealt in some communities. Generation after generation stuck in incredible poverty. Many of these kids have witnessed more trauma in their young lives than most people could ever comprehend. Juvenile Court Administrator Kathy Sinback. Living with uh, domestic violence and witnessing uh, family members get hurt and killed and shot, witnessing neighbors and people in their community get shot and killed, um, witnessing all sorts of um, gun violence and uh, people that they love who have had uh, their lives altered by guns. State versus Maisha Brown. Take for example 16-year-old Maisha Brown, the girl accused in the senseless murder of Rusing Wong. Wong's son sees the tragedy. And for us, we were sad that her life is thrown away in such an early age. But advocates also see a girl, a voracious reader, born into one of Nashville's most violent housing projects. Her dad, a convicted felon, was killed in a car crash when she was just six. Her 19-year-old brother, who had also had his run-ins with the law, gunned down just last year. So for our most troubled youth, they do not feel like they are going to live beyond 20. So they have no hope. These children have no hope. <laughs> And many of the children juvenile officials encounter come into the system with a long history of untreated mental illness. Last year, 14-year-old Giovanni Hernandez was gunned down in the Nashville Village area. Court records showed the shooter, 14-year-old Amarian Johnson, had a history that included ADHD, conduct disorder, major depressive disorder, borderline intellectual functioning, and cannabis use disorder. The court also heard testimony that Amarian had been present in the home when one of his uncles shot an another family member. In addition, Amarian has suffered through other traumatic events, including the disappearance of his mother, the violent deaths of friends and family members, being homeless on the streets of Illinois, and physical abuse and neglect by his father. We have kids who have witnessed their siblings be killed by a parent, um, and, and then that parent go to prison. We have many kids whose parents are incarcerated who have to go and visit their um, parents behind bars. They are broken. These children are absolutely broken. These children are broken and no one is trying to fix them, it seems, sometimes. 
A search of juvenile records shows the greatest number of charges last year came from the 37207 zip code just north of downtown. Close behind was 37208, which has the highest incarceration rate of any zip code in the country. So we know that urban housing policy was based on a lot of redlining policy that actually put poor African-American people in a concentrated area. Ashford Hughes says an honest conversation about juvenile crime also requires confronting the institutional racism that broke up African-American neighborhoods and forced families into ghettos that created mass incarceration and decimated black families. When you talk about the data that we have to show that youth are getting, black male youth are getting expelled as early as kindergarten, if not before, and the access and the direct pipeline to prison, which that leads to, that is public policy, right? That is public policy that is shaping how our youth are involved in this. Many children in those zip codes attend some of the lowest performing schools in the state of Tennessee, schools that are often ill-equipped to deal with the trauma that their kids bring to the classroom. Is it fair to say that there are communities in our city that are in crisis? I think it is fair to say that there are communities in our city that are in crisis at this time and no one in the city is declaring an emergency and saying we've got to fix this problem. I don't know if there's enough cries. As a city, for us to firmly address it, it needs to be considered a health crisis. What happens in North Nashville affects what happens in Madison. The problems that affect Madison also affect what happens in the southeast of Davidson County. So this is a crisis of magnitude that represents the entire county. The juvenile court judge says police and the courts can only do so much to help these children. If the community wants long-term solutions, it's going to take a long-term commitment. For two years, Callaway has been asking the Metro Council for a new $130 million facility to provide interventions that she believes are desperately needed. What we have to do as a community is first of all recognize that we're leaving people behind and recognize when you leave people behind in such dramatic ways that that trauma causes um, for some people bitterness causes anger um, causes people to be hurt and you know there's a famous saying that hurt people hurt people what do you think the consequences are of, of not doing something if we don't do something together as a community as the entire community then we're going to start losing people. Unfortunately, juvenile crime and kids who kill isn't a new problem. 16 years ago, investigative reporter Jennifer Krause sat down for some frank talk with a group of boys who were put behind bars for murder. For this project, Jennifer decided to track down those offenders to look for the lessons from their pasts. He's only in the seventh grade. Friends say Andrew Jefferson was living life in the fast lane. What turns a troubled kid? The young boy that's been charged is the trigger person. Into a hardened criminal. I see it as survival. Everybody else see it as being wrong. And then a repeat offender. Yeah, I have regrets. Yeah, I have a lot of regrets. Because I feel like now that me being old, I could have did more with my life. But perhaps more importantly, how do you stop it from happening? You only have one life to live. And this is not the way to live your life in prison or locked up. Andrew Jefferson has spent much of his life behind bars. And now, 38, he is in prison again. Jefferson first made headlines when he was just 13. Police say 13-year-old Andrew Jefferson shot and killed Alabama truck driver Henry Purnell. He was the youngest person in Middle Tennessee at the time to face murder charges as an adult, yet he was barely a teen. A man who was in the truck with Purnell picked Andrew Jefferson out of a photo lineup. The charges later were thrown out, but then Jefferson was arrested again and sent to prison for yet another murder. And I'm a convicted felon at the age 17. We first talked with him in 2003 at the Riverbend Maximum Security Prison here in Nashville. He talked tough and seemed angry. How sorry are you for what happened? <laughs> How sorry I am. Are you sorry? I mean, I mean, stuff happens. You no, know, stuff happens. 
And Jefferson told us that when he was done serving his sentence, he would do whatever he had to, in his words, to survive. By any means necessary. If that's what it, whatever it takes for me to make it, then I'm gonna have to make it. Robbery. I mean, if that's what it's gonna take. Selling drugs. If that's what it's gonna take. Murdering. I mean, if that's what it's gonna take. Now, 16 years later. I don't remember that. We met Jefferson again for a rare prison interview at the Trousdale Turner Correctional Center. Does it surprise you that you said this? It really do, because I don't think like that now. I'm a whole different person. So surviving now for you is a lot different. Oh, of course it is, because I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Here is back behind bars, where he is now serving 25 years on drug and weapons charges. Jefferson says he tried but couldn't escape the criminal justice system. There's a state's motion to have his bond altered or revoked. And the same thing, it turns out, happened to Terrence McLaurin. I looked up to the big time drug dealers and admiring them for the cool things. We also interviewed him in prison in 2003, where he was serving time for killing a man during a drug deal. Terrence McLaurin made the deal to plead guilty to second-degree murder. McLaurin, at the time of the murder, was just 12 years old. He was then the youngest person ever charged with criminal homicide in Davidson County. McLaurin was one of two people accused of killing 40-year-old Larry Huber. He took my brother's life, and we can't get him back. He can get out and start a new life. Um, and my brother came up. I told him I was sorry. McLaurin later made amends with his victim's family and insisted he was turning his life around. Not wanting to do any more time, really. Yeah. This, this is just the end for me. These kids don't have a prayer. That was Jim Todd when he was the Davidson County Juvenile Court prosecutor. He's now in private practice and remembers McLaurin well. When he came into custody at age 12, he had a very, very, very lengthy record. Todd says McLaurin then became a victim himself of the system. One of the things that he told the evaluator was, when I was arrested on the murder, I could not believe they didn't let me go home. Because he was so used to being arrested and released, arrested and released, arrested and released, arrested and released. So you'd, you'd get in trouble, you'd go in, in jail for a couple hours, and then you'd be sent home? Yeah. And that was it? That was it. Time after time, after you kept getting in more and more and more trouble? Right. Todd says the revolving jail door is only part of the problem. What to do with these kids is another. Todd does not believe sending them to prison when they commit serious crimes is the answer. He got in there and to a system that did not help him. That probably taught him more criminal behavior than he knew before he went in. And when he got out, he was not prepared. Uh, to keep going and struggle. One of the first things McLaurin posted on Facebook after getting out of prison appeared to celebrate a return to the gangsta lifestyle, announcing, I'm here, so make room for a new dawn. And not long after he was released, he was arrested and arrested again and again. Court records, in fact, show he's been arrested more than two dozen times in the last nine years. And you have to prepare them to live their life independent of the environment that they came from. Releasing them back into the environment they came from with the parent that they didn't have is not going to fix it. Were you prepared for your release? No, because you got to think, I was locked up when I was 16, 17. I didn't get out till I was 31 years old. So I'm institutionalized. In my mind, I'm institutionalized. Like, I don't know nothing but prison how I survived in prison. Andrew Jefferson says he tried to survive out of prison. He held several jobs, got married, had a baby, but he was also arrested more than a dozen times, not for robbery or another murder, but a lot of drug charges. Doesn't sound like you have a whole lot of hope. I don't, I don't, I don't. Just cause of what I've been through. Jefferson says he started selling drugs when he was just 11 or 12. He was also carrying guns, stealing cars, and getting arrested. What do you remember about that? Just going to juvenile and sitting in there for a minute and getting out. What if they had locked you up for a longer period of time? Would you have cared? Would that have made a difference? Being young, probably not. Instead, Jefferson believes kids need something other than jail and something other than the streets where they get in trouble. You don't grow up wanting to break the law and murder people and rob people or sell drugs. You don't come out the womb 
with that mind frame. You know, you being, as you grow, you being taught these things. Jefferson says not a lot has changed where he came from. And he believes it's gonna take more than just changing the system, but changing these neighborhoods to change lives. If you know that all the trouble is coming out of these communities, come up with something for these communities to make these communities as a whole feel like it's hope for the community. If the community feel like it ain't no hope, then ain't nobody gonna try.